All please rise. The presiding Justices of the Appellate Division, Chief Administrative Judge of the State of New York, Judges of the Court of Appeals, and the Chief Judge of the State of New York. The State of our Judiciary will now begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lawrence Marks, the Chief Administrative Judge of the Courts, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2018 State of Our Judiciary, which, after a, a stopover last year in Bronx County, is back this year in the Court of Appeals. The first order of business, and I would ask that everyone uh, remain standing, is the Pledge of Allegiance. And we will be led today by Jackson Eddy, who is a student at the Doan Stewart School in Rensselaer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, please remain standing as Sergeant Peter Robinson from Niagara City Court uh, will lead us in the singing of our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rock is red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the At this time, uh, please be seated. At this time, I'd like to introduce some of the very distinguished people who are here with us today, uh, starting first uh, with the uh, associate judges of the Court of Appeals on the bench behind me. In order of seniority, Judge Jenny Rivera, Judge Leslie Stein, Judge Eugene Fahey, Judge Michael Garcia, Judge Rowan Wilson, and Judge Paul Feynman. And alongside me here are the presiding justices of the Appellate Division. Um, on, on my immediate left here is Justice Rolando Acosta of the First Department. Next to him is Justice Alan Shankman of the Second Department. And uh, to his left is Justice Elizabeth Gary of the Third Department. And uh, on the end is Justice Gerald Whalen of the Fourth Department. And Justice Shankman and Justice Gary were just appointed last month, so congratulations to both of you. <laughs> and with us today are for our former associate judges of the Court of Appeals, Howard Levine and um, Carmen Saparic. We are also joined by several former presiding justices of the Appellate Division, uh, Randall Eng, Aaron Peters, Eddie Weinberg Ellerin, and Peter Tom. as well as former Chief Administrative Judge Leo Malonis. 
And I'd also like to recognize our three deputy chief administrative judges, uh, George Silver, Michael Kakoma, and Edwina Mendelson. We are very pleased that with us today is our state's outstanding controller, Tom DiNapoli. <laughs> Representing the governor's office is the counsel to the governor, Alfonso David. And representing the Attorney General's office is Barbara Underwood, the state's Solicitor General. And also from the executive branch is Michael Green, Commissioner of the Division of Criminal Justice Services. And we are also very pleased to be joined today by Mrs. Matilda Cuomo. From the state legislature, uh, here is uh, Senator Jeff Klein, the independent Democratic conference leader. And, uh, Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins, I think, will be uh, joining us momentarily. And um, from the assembly, uh, Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz, chair of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Helene Weinstein, chair of the Ways and Means Committee, is also expected, along with uh, uh, other legislators from both houses. We, of course, are also joined by the court system's administrative and supervising judges, as well as a large number of state appellate and trial court judges, um, and also the clerk of the Court of Appeals, John Asello. A number... A number of our state's district attorneys are here today. Uh, Darcel Clark from Bronx County. <laughs> Eric Gonzalez from Kings County. <laughs> Michael McMahon from Richmond County. <laughs> Scott McNamara from Oneida County, who, who is president of the State District Attorneys Association this year and Madeline Singus from Nassau County. I'd also like to recognize the president of the New York State Bar Association, Sharon Stern Gerstman. And the president of the New York City Bar Association, John Kiernan. along with other uh, bar association leaders who are, are with us today. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Alicia Ouellet, Dean of Albany Law School. <laughs> and Harry Balin, uh, Dean of Toro Law School. <laughs> All right, and now it's my privilege to introduce the Chief Judge. Janet D. Fiore has just completed her second full year as Chief Judge, and in that time she's earned the utmost respect and admiration of everyone who has had the good fortune to work with her. Her colleagues on the Court of Appeals, judges in all levels of courts, judicial and non-judicial administrators across the state, the bar, and our partners in the other branches of government. From day one, she has been fiercely determined to use every ounce of her authority as chief judge to improve the delivery of justice in this state, to ensure that literally every one of the millions of litigants who come to our courts each year in search of justice receives the highest quality of service that we can render. Given the size and breadth and complexity of our state court system, the chief judge's fierce determination, as well as her great energy and ingenuity are exactly what is required. And although there is much more work to be done, there is no doubt that she is succeeding. And I should add, despite all the, all the work that the Chief Judge has to do, she does actually find some time for fun once in a while. Um, so please join me in welcoming Chief Judge Di Fiore, who will speak to us on the state of our judiciary.
Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to Court of Appeals Hall and the 2018 State of Our Judiciary. For more than 30 years, my predecessors in this office, Chief Judges Jonathan Lippman, Judith Kay, and Saul Wachler, have used this annual address to update the public and our partners in government on the priorities of the judiciary and the challenges we face in administering justice. In this State of Our Judiciary Address, I will have the pleasure of summarizing for you the considerable progress we've made to improve our court system, the areas of concern we have identified, the challenges we are working hard to overcome, and the many reforms we have implemented to address what I believe to be our most important goal, building a more dynamic and flexible court system capable of responding promptly and effectively to the changing dynamics of our current caseloads. Indeed, the delivery of justice must keep pace with the needs of our modern society if we are to maintain public trust in the rule of law and the people's confidence that our courts are to remain, in the words of our first president, the firmest pillar of good government. Two years ago, in this very courtroom, I announced the Excellence Initiative. And by now, you're all aware of, and many of you in this room are actively engaged in our statewide campaign to promote efficient court operations and support high quality judicial decision making and court services. Our overarching goal is simply stated, and it goes to the very heart of our constitutional obligation to fairly and promptly adjudicate every case that comes before us. And you will hear today, we are making real progress to improve promptness and productivity and the overall quality of justice in every corner of the state. Our court leaders, our trial and appellate judges, and our court staff are working hard and with a strong sense of purpose to carry out their responsibilities. Thanks to their individual and collective efforts, the state of our judiciary continues to grow stronger with each passing day. So after almost two years of sustained and intensely focused attention to court operations, I am pleased to report the following. Outside New York City, our caseloads are being resolved more efficiently and promptly, and our backlogs are shrinking rapidly. In New York City, we've made significant progress in many of our highest volume courts, and our leadership team has made operational changes to set the stage for further improvement in those courts where we need to do better. More broadly, we're poised to introduce important systemic reforms to make our entire court system fairer, more efficient, and more accessible. So let me begin with our criminal courts, where justice delayed harms everyone, crime victims waiting for justice to be done, prosecutors who watch their cases grow stale and witnesses move away and memories fade, and defendants, presumed innocent under the law, who far too often languish in jail because they can't make bail. Last year, the lead item in the state of our judiciary was the problem of delay in adjudicating misdemeanor cases in the New York City Criminal Court. I pledged that we would move aggressively to change this dynamic by managing cases more actively, eliminating unproductive appearances and wasteful adjournments, and increasing trial capacity. Our focus has been trained on resolving the oldest cases in our inventory by reworking court processes and reassigning judges to expand our trial capacity. I am pleased to report that we have made excellent progress in reducing the oldest cases in our misdemeanor inventory throughout the city by 80% in Manhattan, 71% in Bronx County, and 61% citywide. And we've made meaningful progress outside the city as well with a 28% reduction in the number of misdemeanors pending beyond standards and goals in our city and district courts statewide. 
Thank you to Supervising Judge George Grasso in Bronx County and Judge Tomiko Amaker, Supervising Judge in New York County, recently important, uh, appointed, I have the pleasure to tell you, Administrative Judge of the New York City Criminal Courts, and of course, to the many district and city court judges who have dedicated themselves to clearing backlogs in their courts outside New York City. We've also made noteworthy progress in reducing backlogs in our felony cases. Outside New York City, the number of felony cases pending over standards and goals has been reduced by 53% overall since we started the Excellence Initiative, with the 9th Judicial District achieving an extraordinary 91% reduction together with impressive reductions of 77% in the 7th Judicial District, 65% in, in Suffolk County, and 56% in the 4th JD, all but eliminating the backlogs in those areas. Thank you to the leadership team, Judge Alan Shankman, who was in the 9th now, as you know, PJ in the 2nd, Judge Craig Doran in the 7th, Judge Randy Henricks in Suffolk County, and Judge Vito Caruso in the fourth. In New York City, eliminating felony case backlogs has been more challenging, due largely to the sheer volume of cases in those courts. Nonetheless, we are making encouraging inroads into the backlog. In Bronx County, the number of felony cases pending over standards and goals is down by 28%. Queens County is down by 15%, and in Kings County, that number is down by 16% in just the last year. Thank you to our administrative judges in those counties, Judges Torres, Zayas, and Demick. Thank you very much. And going forward, in 2018, we are determined to aggressively build on our progress to change what has become a culture of delay in too many jurisdictions, and to accelerate our momentum citywide, including in Richmond County, under our newest administrative judge, Desmond Green, and in Manhattan, where administrative judge Ellen Bybin has been reorganizing operations and working with District Attorney Cyrus Vance and the Defense Bar to foster earlier case dispositions. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. On the civil side, court congestion and delay, as we all know, make litigation more expensive, impacting and limiting access to justice for working families, people of modest means, and small business owners. Delay harms people seeking redress for their injuries in tort actions, the largest segment of our civil caseload. It harms matrimonial litigants, as well as so many others who often feel compelled to forego meritorious claims, accept lower settlements, or enter into, into disadvantageous settlements, just to avoid or put an end to the personal and financial burdens that litigation brings. Delay in the civil courts harms our economy as well adding to the costs and uncertainty of doing business in our state and creating an unwelcome climate for investment, economic growth, and job creation. For these reasons, we've made it a priority, a very high priority, to speed the civil litigation process and eliminate backlogs and delay in our civil docket. Outside New York City, the number of cases pending over standards and goals has been reduced by 69% in Nassau, by 57% in the 3rd Judicial District, 49% in the 5th, and 37% for foreclosures alone in the 8th Judicial District. This has been accomplished largely because our administrative judges in those districts, Judges Adams, Breslin, Tormey, and Ferraledo, and their trial judges are focused on proactive case management and using their authority and skills to move cases through the system with speed and purpose. Thank you to each of them. We have also made strides in much of the city with reductions of 36% in Kings County and 30% in Queens County. Administrative judges Lawrence Nipel in Brooklyn and Jeremy Weinstein in Queens have done a simply extraordinary job. 
and in Queens, a county with 2.3 million residents, when we separate our foreclosure docket, 6% of the civil cases are pending over standards and goals. That is among the very best in the state, and it's proof positive that high case volume and court efficiency are not mutually exclusive terms. Kudos to Judge Weinstein and the judges and their staff in Queens County. As you will hear later, Judge George Silver, our outstanding new Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for the New York City Courts, has brought with his appointment energetic leadership and smart, creative ideas designed to move our enormous New York City civil caseloads with more speed, less expense, and above all, enhanced quality. The family court, as I have repeatedly said, is one of the most impactful courts in our system given the nature of the work done there, assisting children and families in crisis. The family court outside New York City continues to keep its eye on the ball with less than 5% of its total pending caseload over standards and goals. That is extraordinary. And in New York City, following a number of highly publicized tragedies, we've experienced an increase of over 50% in neglect and abuse cases filed over the last two years. These, as you know, are among the most serious and complex cases adjudicated in the family court. But notwithstanding this dramatic jump in our filings, the overall number of cases pending over standards and goals is down 4% from the start of the excellence initiatives. That is not happenstance. That is a reflection of the capacity we are developing to respond and adapt to changing conditions and trends through innovative leadership that is focused, it's proactive, and willing to change it up when necessary. And it is a direct product of frontline judges who understand and feel the sense of urgency that attends their work. Thank you to Administrative Judge Jeanette Ruiz and our family court judges and staff for responding to difficult challenges in thoughtful, prompt, and efficient ways. Across the board, in every court, we are determined to develop a proactive management culture that spots emerging trends and responds to changing dynamics in smart, flexible, appropriate, and efficient ways. Simply re repeating the same process year after year, decade after decade, is not acceptable. We have the experience, the talent, and the skill to do better and to be proactive in our management, bold in our approach to problems, and untethered to past practices and structures that no longer serve us well in meeting the needs of our litigants. As you've just heard, the numbers are encouraging. The progress achieved to date proves that smart and agile operational and management support for our judges is the key to their ability to perform their constitutional responsibilities effectively, efficiently, and in ways every New Yorker expects us to. We know we have a lot more work to do and a long way to go. And as I said last year, we're not going to be dancing in the end zone until we achieve all of our goals. But I am supremely confident that our sustained commitment to a more muscular and proactive management philosophy will lead us to operational and decisional excellence. Today, I'm also pleased to inform you of some of the forward-looking initiatives we've introduced under the banner of the Excellence Initiative. Criminal justice reform is an absolute imperative for our courts on every level, from the quality of our decision-making to the fairness and accuracy of the processes by which we do our work, to the elimination of an unacceptable culture of delay and procrastination that has evolved in some of our jurisdictions. And let me start with the process, because any substantive reforms adopted in New York 
must be supported by a system that operates with maximum effectiveness and efficiency. Outside New York City, our criminal court operations, as I noted earlier, are performing well. But inside the city, we face severe challenges, in part because of that enormous caseload we have. We know we have to think differently about how we balance our obligation to do several things at once, ensure speedy justice, and achieve fair and just dispositions consistent with due process of law. And we, every player in the system, judges, prosecutors, members of the defense bar, institutional defense providers, and every city agency that is key to our efficiency must do better, simply put. On any given day, almost 9,000 men and women are being held on Rikers Island. Too many of them on low-level felony or misdemeanor charges unable to make bail and posing no real threat to public safety. This is fundamentally contrary to the original design of our American criminal justice system, in which liberty is the norm and pretrial detention a carefully limited exception. And the cost of incarcerating all these people not only strains the public fisc, but indirectly creates enormous costs to society when people lose their jobs, their homes, or custody of their children. Clearly, we cannot continue down the same path we've followed for decades, not if we believe in the ideal of a criminal justice system where every person accused of a crime, whether rich or poor, is presumed innocent and guaranteed a fair and speedy process leading to a just outcome. And so we welcome proposed reforms recently announced by Governor Cuomo to overhaul our antiquated bail and speedy trial laws, and we look forward to working with the governor, the legislature, and the entire criminal justice community to, to devise common sense solutions that will produce a more equitable and effective criminal justice system for our state. The time for proactive change has come. We cannot simply stand by, content in the false confidence that we are doing all we can, processing case by case. We have to rethink and reorganize the way we are doing business. And there are certainly ways to responsibly do that without compromising either defendants' rights or public safety. When I spoke earlier about the greater success we've had in processing criminal cases outside of New York City, some of you may have been wondering why that is. Volume, of course, is a significant factor. With the city hearing 43% of the state's criminal cases. But another factor is the very smart and responsible way in which felony cases are resolved on a regular basis outside of the city through the use of superior court information or SCIs. Defendants waive their right to prosecution by indictment as allowed by our Constitution and agree to be prosecuted by SCI after prosecutors engage in early case assessment practices and critically provide defendants with early expanded discovery, giving defendants the opportunity to make intelligent informed decisions about whether or not to plead guilty or to put the people to their proof at a trial. The benefits of SCIs are obvious. There are a great many cases which by the nature of their facts can be resolved expeditiously without the need for countless unproductive appearances stretching out over many months and sometimes even years. SCIs allow prosecutors defenders and courts to conserve limited resources while giving defendants, who should be the focus of that process, the opportunity to obtain a fair disposition that enables them to pay their debt to society and get on with the business of rehabilitation. SCIs are significantly underutilized in New York City. 
The average time to dispose of a case by indictment in the city is 277 days, while the average time to dispose of a case by SCI is 120 days. In Westchester County, which I'm very familiar with, the use of SCIs has been an enormous factor in reducing the total number of felony cases pending over standards and goals to literally a single digit number. I am pleased to report that this past December, we boosted our judicial capacity in New York County and in recent days in Kings and Bronx counties as well in order to pilot the increased use of SCIs in the city. And we are encouraged by the fact that the number of SCI dispositions in New York County rose by 50% in the pilot's first month. We are grateful for the support and thoughtful commitment of District Attorneys Darcel Clark, Eric Gonzalez, and Cyrus Vance, each of whom has pledged to identify cases in which prosecution by SCI and the provision of early discovery are appropriate. We are grateful for the support and participation of the Defense Bar and our judges and staff, all of whom have committed to earnestly support the pilot in order to promote the imperatives of speedier justice, a more fair process for the accused, the more efficient use of our limited resources, and fewer defendants in pretrial detention on Rikers Island and in local jail facilities. Criminal justice reform has many moving parts, and this is an important one. And on the topic of unproductive and wasteful court appearances, a source of frustration in every judge's courtroom, we are reducing the frequency with which hearings and trials must be adjourned and rescheduled due to scheduling conflicts on the part of defense counsel whose heavy caseloads often require them to be in three places at one time. Earlier this year, we installed new software in New York City courtrooms that automatically displays when and where individual attorneys are scheduled to appear in court. This new case management tool will allow judges and court staff to schedule future trials and court dates without running into conflicts that create avoidable delay. This is one of the many ways in which we are using new technology in our courtrooms to improve our efficiency. Over the last year, we have succeeded in implementing a very significant legislative reform that will ensure that the right to counsel, one of our most cherished constitutional guarantees, extends to the arraignment of defendants on criminal charges. To facilitate the presence of counsel at off-hour and weekend arraignments, we've piloted four new programs upstate in Broome, Oneida, Onondaga, and Washington counties, counties where counsel at first appearance has, in the past, been difficult to ensure. By reworking our processes, we have done our part to ensure that the state is in compliance with its constitutional obligation to provide effective assistance of counsel, while at the same time reminding mindful of and striving to accommodate the legitimate concerns over the financial and logistical burdens that compliance creates for town and village courts, prosecutors, public defenders, and county governments. Deputy Chief Administrative Judge Michael Kokoma and our administrative judges in the 4th, 5th, and 6th Judicial Districts, Vito Caruso, Jim Tormey, who has been especially helpful, and Molly Fitzgerald deserve credit and thanks for the plans they put together to optimize countywide resources and ensure that judges, defense attorneys, and law enforcement personnel are all available and present at arraignment proceedings, evenings and weekends in one centralized location so that defendants can receive constitutionally guaranteed legal representation. And the real bonus and the most satisfying piece of this uh, initiative and quite frankly exactly what this effort at its core is all about is that the presence of counsel at arraignment is reducing the number of cases in which bail is set Again, when done responsibly and one, when done in appropriate cases, releasing defendants back to their communities is right for the case, 
less disruptive to defendants and their families, and in the end, saves taxpayer dollars. In light of our success with these four pilots, we've requested funding in our budget to support our plan to establish additional centralized arraignment parts this year in Ontario, Warren, Otsego, and Livingston counties. I am proud to say that all three branches of government are working together to support the vital work of the New York State Office of Indigent Legal Services, led by its outstanding executive director, Bill Leahy. And as you will see in our written report on the state of our judiciary, and please take a copy with you on your way out, New York State is well on its way to setting the national standard for a properly funded high quality public defense system. And we should be very, very proud of that. <laughs> Continuing with the same theme of improving the fairness, effectiveness, and accuracy in our criminal justice system, I'd like to focus for a moment on the terrific work that is being done by the New York State Justice Fit Task Force, dedicated to criminal justice reform and led by former Court of Appeals Judge Carmen Beauchamp Saparic and acting Supreme Court Justice Mark Dwyer. The task force has already generated an extraordinary body of reforms addressing the systemic causes of wrongful convictions, including a new rule recently adopted by the Administrative Board of the Courts that requires judges presiding over criminal trials to issue standing Brady orders advising prosecutors and defense counsel of their professional responsibilities, including the prosecution's obligation to disclose exculpatory information and defense attorneys of their obligation to provide constitutionally effective assistance of counsel and what those obligations actually entail. The order, colloquially referred to as the Brady Order, addresses two identified causes of wrongful convictions, Brady violations and ineffective assistance of counsel. The order is the first of its kind in any criminal court in the nation, and I want to thank, <coughs> excuse me, the task force for its bold approach and I especially want to thank Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld of the Innocence Project for their wise counsel, support, and leadership in helping us to achieve this significant reform. Additional recommendations recently made by the task force regarding issues of attorney misconduct and attorney discipline in the context of a criminal case are now under review and where appropriate will be converted into practice. Again, I want to thank the co-chairs, the highly skilled and dedicated task force members, Council Angela Burgess, a very busy partner at Davis Polk, but who is always there and willing to pitch right in and offer her advice and counsel, and of course, Davis Polk and Wardwell for its outstanding and generous pro bono support and service, not to mention the delicious food they provide for us at every meeting. I am Italian. <laughs> I think everyone assembled here today would agree that justice must be tempered by compassion and a thoughtful approach to the societal problems that are reflected in our court dockets. This is especially true for the many New Yorkers who have fallen victim to the tragic and frightening consequences of the opioid epidemic. And so here in New York State, we are adjusting our court processes to reflect our belief that justice without compassion can be unacceptably cruel. According to the latest numbers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, over 64,000 people died from drug overdoses in the United States in 2016. That's more than the number of American lives lost during the entirety of the Vietnam War. So here in New York, we have opened our first opioid intervention court, the first of its kind in New York, but also the first of its kind in the nation. The court is located in the city of Buffalo, hard hit by what is unquestionably a national public health crisis. 
In this court, charged offenders identified as high risk for opioid overdose are immediately linked to intensive treatment. Within 24 hours of arrest, consenting participants represented by counsel are placed in a medication-assisted treatment program. That treatment regimen is followed by up to 90 days of daily court monitoring with the legal process held in abeyance. What makes the opioid intervention court so unique in addition to its treatment protocol is that the individual's treatment plan is prioritized over the prosecution with the legal process being flipped in order to hopefully save lives. I want to publicly acknowledge the work and commitment of the presiding judge of the Buffalo Court, Craig Hanna, a remarkable individual perfectly suited to lead this court, and the Erie County District Attorney, John Flynn, who agreed to suspend prosecution during treatment to achieve the end result we all hope for, a disposition that supports sobriety, public safety, and the well-being of our communities. I also want to thank the project director, Jeff Smith, who took the lead role in developing the opioid treatment model and who has worked tirelessly to foster its effectiveness. And since opening on May 1st, in a jurisdiction that experienced the overdose deaths of dozens of defendants over the course of several years, the court has experienced just a single death among its 204 participants. That is extraordinary. <laughs> Recognizing that this court holds great promise for the rest of the state, we ask the New York State District Attorneys Association to reach out to the defense bar, the treatment community, to formulate the statewide opioid action plan that incorporates the latest knowledge and best practices in this field to guide our courts, the broader justice system, and the treatment community in fashioning more effective responses throughout the state for defendants caught up in the deadly cycle of opioid abuse. And we thank them, the District Attorneys Association, for the way in which they have responded to the call and undertaken the task. Inside New York City, in the Bronx, where 261 people died from opioid overdose in 2016, and the final numbers for 2017 are likely to be higher, District Attorney Darcel Clark, in partnership with Supervising Judge George Grasso, Bronx Community Solutions, the defense bar and treatment providers have adopted the Bronx version of an opioid treatment court, a specialized case track called OR, the Overdose Avoidance and Recovery Track for misdemeanor offenders at high risk for opioid overdose. DA Clark, like DA Flynn in Buffalo, has wisely determined to suspend prosecution of cases at arraignment for those who enter treatment immediately and also agree to waive speedy trial and motion practice. The protocol adopted in Bronx County highly incentivizes treatment. DA Clark has agreed that where no new address ac arrests occur while the case is pending and upon completion of treatment, the case will be dismissed and of course, then the record will be sealed. Smart public safety. We've determined to expand this OR approach and I have asked Judge Grasso to coordinate this effort with the administrative judges, district attorneys, defense bar, and the treatment community to institutionalize the OR parts citywide. Judge Grasso has already begun his work, and we look forward to reporting on our efforts to do our part to stem the rising tide of opioid cases. The final piece of our opioid initiative rests on the shoulders of our well-trained, highly skilled, and compassionate New York State Court officers who last year received the required training to administer Narcan, the critical antidote drug that miraculously and instantaneously reverses an opioid overdose. And our training investment has already paid off. In just a few months, court officers have saved the lives 
of four people overdosing on opioids in and around our courthouses. I want to thank Chief Michael Magliano, Chief Joseph Basilieri, and all of our uniformed court officers who do an outstanding job day in and day out serving and protecting the millions of people, literally millions of people, who come through our courthouses across the state every year. You make us all proud, and we are grateful for the safe environment that you provide. I naturally take great pride in leading a court system that is responding to the complex societal problems reflected in our caseloads through innovative approaches like the Buffalo Opioid Intervention Court and the Bronx Opioid Treatment Courts. And I do want to thank Judge Sherry Klein-Heitler, our Chief of Policy and Planning, and her staff for the work they are doing statewide to make sure we are a court system capable of meeting the unique needs of every class of litigants we serve. Turning now to a different but equally important area of concern and high on our list of reform priorities is the future of the New York City Housing Court. Last year, mindful of the fact that New York City is experiencing its highest levels of homelessness since the Great Depression, as well as the fact that the universal access to legal services law providing legal assistance to low-income tenants facing an eviction was enacted, I announced at the State of Our Judiciary the formation of the Commission on the Future of the New York City Housing Court. As fate would have it, and somewhat ironically, after delivering that State of Our Judiciary address at the Bronx Hall of Justice, as we were driving away from the courthouse up the Grand Concourse past 166th Street, I saw a large crowd of people outside in the cold standing on a sidewalk in front of a building. I asked Officer Sam Torres, who was accompanying me that day, if he knew what was going on over there. And he quietly said to me, Judge, that's your housing court. Needless to say, that sobering image is the very reason why I am so grateful to Justice Peter Tom, Justice Joan Lobus, and their commission members for promptly getting to work and providing us with recommendations that are insightful, practical, and I believe meaningful. Not surprisingly, the commission found that the New York City Housing Court is one of the busiest, most overburdened courts in the nation with over 250,000 filings each year. And as you might imagine, the litigants in this court are overwhelmingly people of modest means, frightened of losing their homes, frustrated by living conditions that threaten the health and well-being of their families. And landlords, too, come to housing court with legitimate issues and concerns. Concerns about losing their properties, losing their livelihoods, and concerns about falling into financial difficulties. The Commission's report comes at a critical time in the housing court's history, with the new legislation expected to greatly reduce the number of unrepresented tenants who appear in that court every day, and the ancillary benefit to us, the freeing up of our court staff and resources previously consumed by assisting those litigants who are appearing without counsel. This welcome change presents us with the opportunity to improve the delivery of justice and the challenge of making sure our already overcrowded dockets do not become more unwieldy and slow moving in the future. And we're wasting no time in implementing the Commission's excellent recommendations. Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks will personally lead a group of high-level judges and court managers responsible for implementing the recommended changes. Including in that group will be Judge Anthony Canataro, our new Administrative Judge of the New York City Civil Court. The group will follow through on major operational changes that have been recommended, adoption of court rules and legal forms, relocation and redesign of our facilities, 
access to justice enhancements, expanded use of technology, increased use of ADR, and of course, increased court security. Again, I want to thank the chairs and the members of the commission for promptly providing a strong vision and an excellent direction for the future of the New York City Housing Court. And so you see, the Excellence Initiative is about much more than standards and goals. Ultimately, it's about supporting decisional excellence, supporting the ability of our judges to make fair, well-informed, and timely decisions, and supporting the ability of our courts to deliver high-quality, cost-effective justice services. The state of our society is so clearly reflected in our court dockets, and whether it's criminal justice reform, Rikers Island, homelessness, foreclosures, opioid abuse, or an alarming increase in child abuse and neglect cases, it is our responsibility to respond. And I know and I have seen firsthand that our judges and court personnel are highly motivated to respond. And that is the energy and the commitment and the vision that fuels our excellence initiative as we work at every level of the justice system to meet the challenges of delivering justice in a complex, fast-changing society. And in that regard, we have indeed trained our focus on children whose lives intersect with the justice system. We are preparing to implement our new Raise the Age legislation. We anticipate that approximately 18,000 16 and 17 year olds will be diverted from the criminal courts to our family courts. And of course, we are pleased and excited that New York has finally trained its focus where it should be, helping young people to stay on track to lead productive lives. We will be ready and prepared for a smooth transition from criminal to family court, mindful of the complex operational and legal hurdles we need to address around the provision of legal counsel, the appropriate housing of children who must be detained, the training of judges and court staff, as well as new data delivery protocols essential to managing this delicate caseload. All of these issues are being carefully examined by our administrative judges and non-judicial managers across the state. And our implementation plan and protocols are being developed under the leadership of De Deputy Chief Administrative Judges Edwina Mendelson and Michael Kokoma, who have been working closely with judges, staff, the Office of Children and Family Services, the Division of Criminal Justice Services, state and local departments of social services, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, corrections and probation, prosecutors, defenders, attorneys for children. We are excited. Candidly, we are a bit nervous, but we will be ready. Now, for every child, rich or poor, a child lucky enough to live in a stable environment or a child by chance living in a less than desirable environment. A strong mentor and a meaningful mentoring relationship can make all the difference in the world. I am so pleased and proud to announce that we have partnered with the New York State Mentoring Program to match young people aging out of the foster care system with inspirational adult mentors who can help them develop the confidence and self-esteem they need to make positive life choices and succeed in the world beyond childhood as young adults. Experience has shown that committed and competent role models can help children overcome enormous personal, economic, and social disadvantages. Under the unique New York State Mentoring Program model, Vetted mentors meet one-on-one -on -one with their mentees on a weekly basis in a supervised environment to establish that special bond and interest that can make all the difference in the world for a child. I want to thank the founder of the New York State Mentoring Program, Matilda Rafa Cuomo, for recognizing and promoting the power and value of mentoring in the lives of children and for her commitment to providing safe mentoring services to children in our family courts. 
Thank you, Mrs. Cuomo, for prompting and prodding us to action. Thank you to New York State Mentoring, to Judge Jeanette Ruiz for getting this program off the ground, and Judge Andra Ackerman for planting the seed for us. Thank you so very much. We are also focused on supporting the well-being of children by supporting the legal needs of their parents. New York's parental representation system has suffered from many of the same systemic deficiencies that once afflicted our indigent criminal defense system, including excessive attorney caseloads, inadequate training, and insufficient funding for support staff and services. I have asked the former presiding justice of the appellate division, 3rd Department Karen Peters, to lead a new commission on parental legal representation that will examine the current state of mandated family court representation to determine the future delivery of quality, cost-effective parental representation. Judge Peters' experience, particularly as a former family court judge, will be invaluable to leading the work of the commission. She and the judges, legal service providers, child welfare experts, and county and state officials on the commission will work closely with the Office of Indigent Legal Services, particularly Director of Quality Enhancement, Angela Burton, which has begun laying the groundwork to improve the quality of parental representation across our state. Very exciting and critical work. Thank you. And with all of these moving parts, it's absolutely imperative that our courts make smarter use of technology to support the complex, substantive work we're doing. And I'm pleased to say that our New York City Family Court, with over 200,000 new case filings each year, is leading the way in this regard, having recently become the largest paperless court in the state and one of the largest in the country. Terrific, terrific work. The benefits of going all digital in newly filed cases, I think, are obvious. We improve efficiency and accessibility, streamline case commencement, allow parties to view and print signed orders of petitions remotely, and certainly we facilitate efficient management of our court's staggering caseloads. Thank you to Chief Clerk George Cafasso, Deputy Chief Clerk Michael McLaughlin, and Chip Mount and Sheng Guo from our Division of Technology for your excellent, excellent service. You are leading the way for the state court system. Thank you. In recognition of the amazing diversity of our communities throughout the state, and of course, our responsibility to ensure access to justice for all, we launched a pilot program enabling judges to issue orders of protection in English and the language of the petitioner. Last year, the legislature endorsed and codified our pilot program and authorized its expansion. Our judges have now issued over 25,000 bilingual orders of protection in Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic in our family, criminal, integrated domestic violence and matrimonial courts. And by the end of 2020, orders of protection will be available statewide in the 10 languages most frequently spoken here in New York. I want to thank Judge Deborah Kaplan, recently appointed to serve as the administrative judge of the New York County Supreme Court civil term, and who was our statewide coordinating judge for family violence cases. I want to thank her for the excellent job she did leading the work of that office. The expansion of our bilingual order of protection initiative will surely make an important difference for those litigants for whom English is not their first language. Now turning for a moment back to the civil courts. Our commercial division of state Supreme Court has built a reputation for excellence and has rightly earned the respect of court and business leaders around the globe. The commercial division has led the way in adopting innovative reforms to streamline civil litigation, 
improve efficiency and reduce litigation costs, including limits on interrogatories and depositions, quicker resolutions of discovery disputes, time limits on trials, and direct testimony by affidavit. To my mind, there is absolutely no reason to keep these successes confined to the commercial division. So I have asked our advisory committee on civil practice to evaluate the commercial division rules and amendments and recommend which of them should be adopted broadly throughout our civil courts. The process is underway and the committee will submit its report and recommendations to us on a short timeline by May 1st and we look forward to hearing from them. Anyone reviewing our civil docket would immediately recognize the high percentage of cases that involve major insurance company defendants. For many reasons, these cases have taken an inordinate amount of time to resolve. Litigants in these cases need their cases and their litigations to be resolved promptly. And our Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for the courts inside New York City, George Silver, has responded. We now have four pilot programs that have been a smashing success, consistently settling between 60 and 100 percent of the calendared cases in those parts in New York, Kings, Bronx, and Richmond counties. This program differs from prior efforts involving major insurance carriers because with this pilot, the assigned judges are intervening earlier before significant time and resources have been expended on discovery and trial preparation. Cases that ordinarily would drag through our system for years are now being resolved within a year of filing. The pilot has been so successful that additional carriers and high volume litigants have asked to participate in the new protocol. And as you would expect, we are of course expanding the program to accommodate the request. I think Judge Silver would be the first to agree this is not about rewriting the code. It's about understanding the charge and thinking outside the limitations and constraints of past dated protocols and practices. Thank you, Judge Silver, the judges and staff in the pilot parts, and all of the participants. Thoughtful approaches like this one and our demonstrated willingness to try new ideas and implement new practices is how we will continue to best serve the people who come to our courthouses to resolve their legal issues. Our New York City Small Claims Court, where tens of thousands of individuals and small business owners appear, usually without a lawyer, to resolve their disputes under $5,000, this court, this court is truly the people's court. And while the issues may not be as complex as those heard in our other civil courts, these issues are real and oftentimes critical to the people who appear here every day. By making some fundamental adjustments to our operations, like expanding our staffing levels, as well as expanding our hours of operation, we've reduced the average time between the filing of a claim and the first court of appearance by more than half. And litigants in this court are now the recipients of improved, accelerated services. Our commitment to the prompt adjudication of cases and controversies goes hand in hand with our commitment to meaningful access to justice. Our permanent commission on access to justice, led by Helene Barnett, has been a catalyst behind New York's status as a national leader in addressing the civil legal needs of low-income people. Although funding is absolutely critical to our efforts and this year, thanks to the wisdom and commitment of the governor and the legislature, we anticipate continued levels of civil legal service funding in our budget. We have learned that money alone without a plan can't close the justice gap. So we have been careful, strategic, and smart in our approach. And now we are well on our way into devising a statewide strategic action plan that will integrate all of the resources and services at our disposal 
into an efficient and effective delivery system that fills gaps in service and avoids duplication and potential waste. My role is to lead us to the place where we are leveraging to the maximum every private and taxpayer dollar and every hour of lawyer pro bono that has been dedicated to our civil legal service efforts. Our strategic action plan for New York State, led by Chair Barnett and the Commission, and funded by a grant from the National Center for State Courts, it's underway, featuring the launch of a pilot project in Suffolk County that is focused on developing a technology platform and community resource model that operating together will significantly enhance access to justice at the local level. The Suffolk pilot will spawn local strategic plans around the state with the idea of knitting those plans together into an overall statewide network that makes the most effective use of all available resources. This is a high priority for us, and we look forward to working with our partners throughout the state to implement the action plan. I want to thank on behalf of all of us across the state, Helene Barnett, the members of the commission, Judge Hinrichs, and all of the folks in Suffolk County who are providing the blueprint to take our efforts statewide. And our mission to increase and enhance access to justice is advanced in many different ways and through countless initiatives across the justice system. And so I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our Deputy Chief Administrative Judge in charge of justice initiatives, Edwina Mendelson. Judge Mendelson and her staff have a broad portfolio of initiatives that promote access to justice from within the court system, including court-based programs that provide pro bono legal and informational assistance to litigants, our web-based resources that reach well over a million people a year, and our programs designed to remove language and disability barriers. Thank you, Judge Mendelson and your staff for the hard work you are doing across criminal, civil, family, and housing court. And our timeliness and efficiency priorities are especially important in our surrogates court, where surviving family members or individuals who are in need of guardianship should never be exposed to unnecessary delay. Effective this spring, for the first time, standards and goals will be in place for surrogates court proceedings. And thanks to the new case management software and dashboards, we are tracking our caseloads, measuring our performance, and better managing our work in every area of this important court's services. I want to thank the Surrogates Courts Judges Association, led by Oneida County Surrogate, Louis Giliotti, for being so helpful and receptive to this effort. And we look forward to enhancing management practices in this important court for the benefit of all litigants who appear before our surrogate judges. Now, this state of our judiciary address would not be complete without recognizing our terrific appellate division, led by presiding justices Rolando Acosta, Alan Shankman, Elizabeth Gary, and Gerald Whaling, as well, of course, as our former presiding justices from the second and the third, Randall Lang and Karen Peters. These men and women are constantly striving for excellence in their departments. Last year, we began the effort to develop a uniform set of rules to harmonize appellate practice across the state, including service and filing procedures, general motion practice, and methods of perfecting an appeal. Under the direction of our presiding justices, the chief clerks of each of the four departments Susanna Rojas, April Agostino, Robert Mayberger, and Mark Bennett, who was preceded by Fran Caffarel, worked closely with our OCA counsel, John McConnell, to draft joint rules. The rules were issued for public comment over the last summer, amended to incorporate the excellent commentary we received through the public comment process, 
and I am pleased to inform you today that the rules have been approved by the Administrative Board and will take effect on September 15th. There is no question in my mind that the new uniform rules will have a positive impact on New York appellate practice. The four departments have also adopted joint e-filing rules to take effect on March 1st. Kudos to the presiding justices and their excellent staffs for bringing the convenience and savings of e-filings to our appellate courts. This, trust me, was not an easy lift, so I want to thank all of you. And in recognition of something we all know, that transparency is a most important step in building public confidence and respect for our courts, we are proud to showcase the live streaming of oral arguments from each of the four departments now, and of course, from right here at the Court of Appeals. Enabling the public to watch our work from internet-connected devices is a wonderful way for everyone to observe and experience firsthand the appellate process at work. At the core of our commitment to excellence and productivity is, of course, judicial training and education. And I do want to thank Judge Juanita Bing Newton, the Dean of the Judicial Institute, and her staff for the extraordinary job they do to provide a complete and robust training regimen for all of our judges court attorneys, court clerks, and court manage managers. A fulsome description of the curriculum that is now offered through the JI is set out in our written state of our judiciary, which is available here in hard copy, I'll say it again, and on our website, and where you can also read about the great progress we've made in developing a definitive guide to New York State evidence, thanks to the work of the members of the New York Evidence Committee, co-chaired, by retired Court of Appeals Judge Susan Reed and retired Supreme Court Justice Bill Danino, assisted by their counsel, very able counsel, Professor Michael Hutter of Albany Law School. As we have pursued excellence in our court, we have often experienced frustration with barriers that hinder our progress. Unnecessary judicial restrictions that jurisdictional restrictions that prevent us from managing our people and resources efficiently. Neither the federal courts nor any other court system labor under the same kinds of archaic rules we have here in New York. In fact, Article Three of the United States Constitution, which contains fewer than 400 words, states very simply, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. By contrast, Article 6, our judiciary article in the New York State Constitution, contains over 16,000 words is spread over 37 sections and dictates details of our existence that would best be decided by the legislature or court administration. Amending the judiciary article to modernize our organizational structure is a top concern for us, as it should be for every elected official who cares about the impact of court efficiency and the considerable savings which can be achieved through reform. And let me be clear, we are not deterred by last year's thumbs down vote on a con con. Yes, I saw the lawn signs and the bumper stickers and I heard the ads on the radio and it was crystal clear to anyone paying close attention that the voters were not at all focused on the judiciary article of the Constitution. But we are, and we are determined to continue moving forward and work with the members of our judicial task force to develop and propose practical constitutional amendments that can be achieved through the legislative process and referendum process.
I want to thank the task force members, a uniquely qualified group of individuals for their excellent service. And I encourage those of you who have already reached out to the members to continue to do so and inform them of your views, your ideas, and your experiences. We look forward to developing our plan and presenting it to the legislature for action. In bringing this state of our judiciary address to a close, I want to turn for a moment to matters external to our courts, yet integral to who we are as a caring legal profession. Last summer, as we watched the news of Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria, one could literally feel the sense of urgency developing in our New York legal community to respond to these disasters and assist in every way our training and experience as lawyers would allow. In a single morning and with just a few phone calls, we created the New York State Task Force on Legal Assistance Related to Hurricanes. Under the leadership of John Kiernan, president of the New York City Bar Association and a partner at Debevoise and Plimpton, and Sharon Katz, special counsel for pro bono at Davis Polk and Wardwell. I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank the task force members and the many lawyers, bar associations, legal service providers, and law schools, too numerous to mention here, though the City Bar and the Puerto Rican Bar Association deserve special mention for their incredible response and outpouring of generosity. Please do pick up that written report on the way out and read about what the task force has accomplished, including establishing clinics for displaced victims and connecting them with pro bono representation, training volunteer lawyers, and raising and donating charitable funds. And read the heartfelt letter of thanks we received from the Chief Judge of Puerto Rico acknowledging our critical help. And don't forget, there is much, much more work to be done in Puerto Rico. Last year, I concluded the state of our judiciary with a story about the beautiful clock hanging in the lobby of the Manhattan Criminal Court Building at 100 Center Street. Our effort to repair that clock after years of being frozen in time <laughs> has come to symbolize who we are as a court system. As you have heard today, the judges and staff of the New York State Courts have been working diligently over the last year to fix what's broken and to build and maintain a well-functioning court system. To them I say, the road to excellence is long and arduous, but the destination is worth every bit of the effort. I am grateful to all of my colleagues here on the Court of Appeals, to our trial and appellate judges, to Chief Administrative Judge Marks, to the presiding justices of the appellate division, Deputy Chief Administrative Judges Mendelson, Kokoma, and Silver, our team of administrative and supervising judges, Ron Yunkins, and our team of non-judicial court managers, our public safety leadership and uniform court officers, and the entire non-judicial staff of the unified court system. Thank you for leading the way and for your work to build a system that supports both operational and decisional excellence in every court at every level throughout this state. We can look back on the last two years with great pride and a sense, satisfying sense of accomplishment. And while there is much more to do, we can look to the future with confidence and optimism because we are poised and positioned to build upon everything that we have achieved to date. Congratulations to all of you. I wish you continued success in your work, and God bless you and keep you well.
So that, that concludes today's program. I want to thank everyone for attending. You are all invited to a reception at the State Bar Association up the street uh, that will start immediately. And again, on your way out, it was noted that there's a <laughs> written version of, this, of the state of our judiciary. There's also pick up a copy of our report on the last year uh, progress of the Excellence Initiative and also the report of our Housing Court Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you.